welcome, really, to the third annual Don Ricks Distinguished Keynote Address. Um, and it's a real opportunity in the community here to provide perhaps some background information that might be of interest to you and allow an opportunity at the end not only for questions, but also a reception so that we can chat to each other and to, uh, and to our, particularly our guest, uh, Dr. Eric Green. Tonight, though, we recognize Don, Don Ricks. I'm just going to mention a little bit about Don. He was one of the co-founders of Genome BC, and he was our chair for four formative years. Now, Don was interesting because he was a physician who saw the need in his practice for better di uh, diagnostics, founded a system of clinical labs, which today is known as Life Labs across Canada. Uh, he was a physician as well to Michael Smith, UBC's Nobel laureate, who convinced him that genomics was an important science for the future. And to quote, quote Haig Ferris, who was also one of our board members, Don Ricks was a man of action, a man of vision, a man of compassion, and a great Canadian. He was a great entrepreneur, a committed angel investor, and a generous and effective donor to many causes. Don was quick to support young entrepreneurs and educational initiatives. Where others saw problems, Don saw opportunity. His cheerful, constructive contribution to every organization he supported was an inspiration to everyone, and his legacy of commitment will influence our community for generations. That was Haig's quote. So that the GNVC board decided that one way we could recognize Don Ricks and his legacy is to establish this, this annual keynote address as a way to both encourage and inspire our community. And that's why we've invited you here. So last year's guest, Dr. Leroy Hood, was an exceptional speaker whose contributions to, our, to the understanding of systems biology are significant. Before that, Mark Walcourt, the head of the Wellcome Trust, provided us with a background of where he felt the investments <coughs> in the Wellcome Trust would be most placed over the next several years. What's interesting is the threads come together. Tonight we have Dr. Eric Green, and we're really excited about this. Dr. Green from the US National Institutes of Health brings us a unique perspective on the applications of genomics to the pursuit of personalized medicine. And then just a, a personal note, um, as you know, um, the, in the US, this is headquartered in Washington, DC, and we of course had Hurricane S Sandy come through the East Coast with devastating results. And um, for several days this week, we were in probably hourly contact by email with Dr. Green's assistants and various people trying to figure out how to get out of Washington if there was a problem and uh, which airports might be open and uh, what would be other ways to get to the West Coast and all of that sort of thing. So we're very pleased on that level as well to have Eric join us uh, tonight. And let me just give you a little bit of background on, on Eric and then I'll ask him to come forward. So Dr. Green became the third director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, that's called NHGRI, that's part of the National Institutes of Health uh, in the States in December 2009, and that really is the focal point for the vision, if you like, for the Human Genome Project and beyond, the application of that uh, within the US. And immediately prior to his appointment, he was the scientific director there, and so he and Francis Collins worked together uh, for many years, really from the, the beginning or the beginning of the, let's say, acceleration of the Human Genome Project through to its conclusion when, uh, when it was announced by uh, uh, the President, etc. Dr. Green received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Wisconsin and both a PhD and MD in 1987 from the Washington University in St. Louis. And that's an important thing because if you listen to Eric's background, remember it's it's not only the science, but the science through the lens of a physician that is really important uh, to us when we look at applications of the science that we fund. Dr. Green was appointed Assistant Professor of Pathology, Genetics, and Internal Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine, as well as co-investigator in the Human Genome Center at Washington University. Uh, in, a, in, in addition to that, while directing his, his own research group, etc., in terms of mapping, sequencing, and understanding the, the genome, and then moving into the Human Genome Project, and then with NHGRI, this led to a completion of a strategic planning process that yielded a new vision for the future of genomics research, and, entitled 
charting a course for genomic medicine from base pairs to bedside, and I'm sure Eric will respond to that or talk to that, which was published in, 19, in uh, 2011 in Nature magazine. So that's the, the background, Eric. I hope it gives you a little bit of, uh, of his background. I'm sure he'll talk more about his own, his own journey, because that's one of the interesting things here, because I know there are many students and others who have joined us tonight. And after this time, there's also an opportunity for questions and answers, and I hope you'll not be shy around that. I mean, there are many questions I can seed a couple for you. You know, what experience, what started as experience in science, was it his father's influence? Was it being a physician? Did he know every step that this was the next step going to be? And I think he's already answered that that's probably no. Now, is there a need to understand the human genome, etc. Et so I'm sure you can ask some of these interesting questions, and we look forward to it. So without further ado, Dr. Eric Green. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Alan. And let me say from the outset, I'm uh, delighted to be here. I am honored to be giving a lecture named after Don Ricks, clearly a, a great uh, member of this community and great contributions um, to the scientific enterprise and the clinical enterprise here. And I'm certainly honored uh, to be following uh, my predecessors in this lecture series, uh, Mark Walpart and uh, Lee Hood, both good friends of mine and also visionary leaders um, in, in, in genomics and biomedical research. Um, I will uh, say uh, from the outset that I, I do apologize for a little bit of anxiety that I created to the organizers. Uh, I did survive Hurricane Sandy. We, there was a lot of anxiety about what was going to happen in the Washington, D.C. area. We dodged the bullet. Um, and, but even having dodged the bullet, um, it was unclear how quickly airports were going to get functional again. Um, and whether I would get out successfully yesterday, but I did, and I'm here, and I'm delighted uh, that uh, we didn't have to disrupt the proceedings, but I, I will agree there was a lot of nail-biting that went on, and a lot of uncertainty. What I want to tell you about um, over the next uh, 50 or 55 minutes or so is really a story about uh, genomics and the landscape of genomics and how we are bringing genomic medicine and applications of genomics to clinical practice increasingly into focus. And, it is interesting because as an endeavor, the relevance of genomics has been changing um, over the past uh, decade or so, uh, and actually even before then. You know, for a long time, the relevance of genomics was really pretty much focused on biomedical researchers pursuing the study of genomes. I think in more recent years, as I'll describe to you, it's become increasingly relevant to healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, genetic counselors, and so forth. But what I want to convince you in my talk is that increasingly uh, genomics is becoming relevant to patients and to friends and relatives of patients, and in fact, relevant to all of you who are either patients or are friends or, or relatives of patients. And it's this relevance of genomics, I think, that's, that's going to make it increasingly an important discipline uh, to be thinking about even as a member of society uh, if you're not already a scientist in the audience or a physician or a healthcare professional in the audience. So what I want to describe to you in, uh, in uh, providing an overview of the human genomics landscape and recognizing a very relatively broad audience of, uh, of varying backgrounds is I, I want to first of all set a context uh, by describing a little bit about the past and a little historic history I think will be important to, to review. Um, I think the emphasis on my talk is going to be on the present and particularly structured around a strategic vision for genomics that our institute uh, published uh, last year that Alan introduced you a little bit about, and I'm going to tell you about in detail. But then I want to also make sure to tell you what I know you're interested in, and that's about the future, and where I think all this is leading. So with these three major areas in mind, let me start with some history. A lot of places I could start in describing uh, important foundational uh, milestones in genomics. Um, I think probably the most appropriate one uh, would be to take you back to April of 1953, uh, when Jim Watson and Francis Crick uh, published this paper in Nature, arguably the most significant publication of the last century in the biomedical research literature, describing the double helical structure of DNA, earning them the Nobel Prize. But in addition to that, it was the insights provided by knowledge of the double helical structure of DNA that gave us some critical information about how it was that DNA was the information molecule necessary for life. 
And that, of course, then led to a series of major advances, for example, in the 1960s, with the elucidation of the genetic code, giving us the insight of how it was that DNA encoded information made for making proteins, and exactly the code that was used for um, providing information about the sequence of amino acids in proteins. Uh, that then led to technology advances later that it particularly came to a punctuation mark in the 1980s with the molecular biology revolution and the advent of DNA cloning, which provided us the ability to manipulate DNA in the laboratory. And that found its way spread throughout the biomedical research enterprise as molecular biology came to the forefront uh, for understanding many aspects of, of physiology uh, through recombinant DNA technologies. And importantly, by the 1980s, the realization that we understood fundamentally what DNA was all about. It was this incredibly complex and yet incredibly simple molecule. It consists of four chemicals. We don't even waste our time just naming the chemicals. We just abbreviate them A, G, C, and T. And what the 1980s brought us was an appreciation of we could go into the genetic blueprint of humans and human DNA, and we could not only isolate that DNA, we could actually sequence the DNA. And some of the earliest methods for DNA sequencing came out in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And we had then had the tools for reading our genetic blueprint. But importantly, we also realized that it was a finite problem. Now, the human genome fundamentally consists of three billion letters. And we know how to read those letters through these sequencing methods. And so in the 1980s came ideas that increasingly came to fruition. The idea of, well, let's just read our genetic blueprint. Let's elucidate the sequence of the human genome. And that gave rise, of course, to this effort known as the Human Genome Project, which commenced in 1990. It was this large, unprecedented effort for biomedical research because it was very collaborative, very team-oriented, international in scope, highly focused in the goal, and audacious with respect to what it was trying to accomplish. Completely sequenced the three billion letters that constitute the human genetic blueprint. My story uh, is relevant from the point of view of having just graduated medical school and entering into a residency in clinical pathology in the late 1980s. I had the opportunity to join a research lab and found my way into a lab that was creating some of the technologies that were being used uh, for some of the first efforts of the Human Genome Project and found myself then as a trainee uh, recently graduated from medical school, having the opportunity to participate in the Human Genome Project on the front line from day one and able to ride it out to the end. I built my early career by basically dedicating myself to the goals of the Human Genome Project. I will tell you quite candidly that those of us who participated in the Genome Project were incredibly drawn to its audacious goal and the marvelous opportunity of doing something unprecedented in scale and scope. At the same time, I will also admit to you by telling you that we were incredibly terrified because we fundamentally had no idea how to actually sequence the human genome, but we were given the resources and the opportunity to do something audacious, and a lot of smart people came together and we figured it out. And that then led to a remarkable sense of purpose, and then with that came remarkable successes. And just a little over 10 years later or so came a draft sequence of the human genome uh, published in this landmark publication in Nature, one might find that this publication might be one of the most significant publications of this century, albeit we have a long way to go in this century to make such a determination. A little bit more work beyond this draft sequence, and then in April of 2003 came the completion of a, of a sequence in the human genome, and with that came an end to the Human Genome Project. Well, that was nine and a half years ago. For those of you keeping track of numbers, it was 3,489 days ago that the Human Genome Project was completed. And you might be asking questions like, well, what have you done lately? And now I want to tell you what we've done lately. This was a historic time of nine and a half years ago. I will certainly tell you in April of 2013, expect to see lots written about and lots publicized about the 10th anniversary of the completion of the human genome sequence. And there have been, over the last nine and a half years, remarkable applications of genomics in many different areas, even beyond of human uh, biology. I would just show some of them here, and I know people that kind of think about this and are active, and I know that Genome BC, for example, is involved in some of these, and these are all important areas that have found genomics to be important parts of advancing um, these particular areas. Um, I will tell you that working at the U.S. National Institutes of Health, you might imagine our focus in applying genomics has been squarely um, um, centered around health, disease, and medicine. 
But it's not just focusing on health disease and medicine. It's important to also appreciate sort of where we are in terms of um, at, at, at the National Institutes of Health, thinking about what the sort of main mission and purpose and how we might think about applications of genomics. The NIH, more broadly, its uh, mantra is turning discovery into health. And increasingly, we're being asked to apply genomics and other uh, advances um, into um, health applications. And as the, one of, one of the, institu as the institute responsible for leading genomics research at NIH, the National Human Genome Research Institute, you know, we firmly believe our mission now is to advance human health through genomics research, using the Human Genome Project as sort of our starting point in this endeavor. So increasingly, and as you heard about just about three years ago, I was appointed the director of this institute, we are thinking long and hard about how it is that we can apply genomics to improve human health, to apply genomics to medically relevant problems, and think about how clinically this is going to become part of the mainstream. And so my role as director is to think about a mission and think about our vision for this. And it very much is squarely placed on this idea of genomic medicine. And by genomic medicine, I mean this is an emerging medical discipline that involves using an individual's genomic information as part of their clinical care, not treating patients generically but rather recognize that each and every one of us has a unique genetic blueprint. And that genetic blueprint can now be looked at, and we can we develop approaches to use that for the clinical care of that patient. And we are very much focused on seeing this become a reality. And that focus becomes a metaphor that I like to think about in this, because very much what we're talking about is bringing genomic medicine into focus. And again, if you think about the history of this, I think when the Genome Project began, there was some imagery that, yes, someday we would be able to use what we learned in the Human Genome Project to somehow influence how we treat patients. I think it was relatively vague at that point. I think by the year 2003, uh, when the Human Genome Project concluded, it was a little bit more coming into focus, but still we were a long way away from achieving genomic medicine at any real scale. And so I view that what we needed to do in the field of genomics, starting with the Genome Project, was to sort of view it as a journey, a path to achieving genomic medicine and bringing it into focus. And I think the journey began with the Human Genome Project. It was not the end of anything. It was the beginning of everything. That was the starting line. And when we realized genomic medicine, then we will have accomplished what I think we needed to do um, in this journey. Now, I will admit there's many steps in this progression. I don't know all of those steps. But I do know that we were successful at the Human Genome Project. We've got to be successful at realizing genomic medicine. And the reason why is because we made a promise when we pursued the Human Genome Project that this was going to lead to better ways of treating patients. And I think that'll fulfill the promise if we are successful in this journey. So what's been done in nine and a half years? Well, I will tell you, in thinking about this journey and progressing from if you will, the base pairs of the human genome to the bedside of patients, or if you prefer the metaphor from helix to health. The day the Human Genome Project ended, our institute published a strategic plan in 2003 that outlined the journey that one might move forward on, starting with a sequence of the human genome. And what that journey basically tried to describe was moving from the genome project's uh, uh, generation of the sequence of the human genome in 2003 applying this to health and, and applying it to biological pursuits in, in relatively uh, uh, early embryonic ways uh, because we had just got the sequence for the first time. And it, it portrayed a way of getting us to where we might be a decade or, or so later that maybe brought it a little bit more into focus. Um, but what I will tell you is that what has happened since the nine and a half years uh, clearly surprised many of us at how fast things were progressing. And what this led to was the realization that while this 2003 vision was quite effective, I mean, it actually, uh, we've been so successful, it was time to come up with a new strategic vision for genomics. And so another strategic planning process uh, was embarked by our institute, and Alan mentioned this earlier, and that led to last year a publication um, of a new vision for genomics, one much more um, oriented towards bringing genomic medicine into focus. Um, this publication, which uh, came out in precisely the 10th anniversary issue of Nature that the decade earlier had published that draft sequence of the human genome, described sort of the next phase of this journey uh, from base pairs to bedside. Um, for those of you who might be interested in accessing this, um, if you just want to write down this URL real quick, you can get to a PDF freely available to anybody, as well as a lot of information about our strategic planning process. And I would welcome you to read this. This is written for a very uh, broad uh, audience. 
and if you're interested in anything I'm saying, I would, and you haven't read this, I would strongly urge you to write that URL down and feel free to download the PDF, share it with any of your friends, uh, give it out as a Christmas gift if you like, and then enjoy it. So what I thought, I, and, and really, more than anything, I will tell you, is what this strategic plan aims to do, is to finally bring into much sharper focus what we know now, and over the next maybe decade or so, finally bringing into focus this imagery of genomic medicine. And what we heard more than anything else during the strategic planning process uh, that, that cultivated in that publication was that it was time now. It was time to be more specific and more sophisticated in describing how you were going to go from genomic information to actually changing the practice of medicine. And at the end of the day, what we found was useful to describe the next phase of this journey was to describe sort of five domains of research activity uh, that, are, that encompass this progression. Uh, that take us into an era of genomic medicine. I'll introduce you to each of these five domains. The first domain of research activity is doing research to understand the structure of genomes. So I'm reasonably familiar, we've been doing that for a while. The next domain involves using genomic research to understand the biology of genomes, understanding how genomes actually work. Using that knowledge then to start to apply this to problems in clinical medicine by doing genomics to understand the biology of disease. Then moving forward with that knowledge to do, use genomics research to advance medical science, to advance the science of medicine. But you can't stop there because all of you recognize just because you have a medical advance doesn't mean you change the effectiveness of healthcare. We have a responsibility to also pursue research that demonstrates that we can use genomics to actually improve the effectiveness of healthcare. So these five domains become a framework by which we now think about all the research endeavors that we want to do in genomics. The other thing that's very useful about these five domains as an organizing framework is it gives us a chance to sort of look back on the previous 20 years and think about what we've accomplished in genomics. And also later in the talk, I'll tell you how we can look forward and do the same thing. So what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. We can represent how we've accomplished things across these five domains over different time intervals. So for example, during the Human Genome Project, if we simply, and all hypothetical, represented every accomplishment as a blue dot, and as the dots pile up on each other, they get more and more dense, they change color, eventually become red, you can see that where all the accomplishments were mostly focused on that first domain, understanding the structure of genomes. Yeah, we did a little bit where we learned how genomes work, but fundamentally, the center of gravity was firmly placed on that first domain. What about the nine and a half years or so since the end of the Human Genome Project? Looks something like this. We continue to explore how genomes were put together, and then we particularly started to understand how the genome worked, the biology of genome, and with that came opportunities to study some diseases, and maybe even a couple things we got a little bit more clinical. So let me spend some time now reviewing the last nine and a half years or so, and tell you about all these blue dots of accomplishments, if you will. What has been accomplished over the last nine and a half years or so since the end of the Genome Project? And to describe this to you, to set a context, I'm going to tell you about five steps along this journey from base pairs to, to bedside of patients. And it will show you some of the accomplishments and also indicate to you what we still need to do. So in thinking about this progression, one of the first things we needed to do, step number one, we needed to understand the function of the human genome sequence. Now what do I mean by that? Why do we need the function? Let me remind you, what did the Human Genome Project produce? Uh, and by the way, in understanding the functions, pretty much research activities in these first two domains. This is what the Human Genome Project produced. Actually, to be honest with you, this is only 0.001% of what the Human Genome Project produced. But you get the idea. Just imagine 3 billion Gs, A's, D's, and C's in a very precise order. When the Genome Project ended nine and a half years ago, we had relatively cursory tools for actually interpreting the sequence. We were good at generating the sequence, but understanding this language, we were, we were early days. In fact, one of the things we recognized is that we were so early days, we were good at sequencing, that when we didn't know how to interpret it very well, we found it very useful to appreciate the fact that if we had our genomic sequence, and we compared it to other animals' genomic sequence, maybe by comparison we could figure out what's important and what's not important. We could sort of use some theories of evolution to say, well, if sequences stay the same between us and related mammals, those must be important, because otherwise evolution tends to go in there and scramble up those letters. And so recognizing our place on sort of the phylogenetic tree of mammals, we are one little insignificant twig on a very complicated tree. 
And so off we went in the genomics community sequencing other animals. It included laboratory animals like mice and rats. It included companion animals like dogs, some of our closest relatives like the chimpanzee. But we also wanted to survey across this tree to be able to sort of capture all the innovation that existed across the different mammalian species. So we went off and we grabbed elephants and tree shrews and, and porcupines and aardvark, all sorts of creatures representing different important points on the phylogenetic tree of mammals. In fact, today we've sequenced probably something of 30 different mammalian species. And we've been able to pile all that sequence data into computers and analyzed it and found the patches of the human genome sequence that are conserved across all mammals. And those are the things that are most likely to be functionally important. What have we learned from such comparative studies? Well, we've learned quite a bit. It's actually been sometimes revealing, for example. We now know that something on the order of 5% of our letters across the 3 billion letters of the human genome sequence, about 5% heavily conserved across virtually all mammals, which means that at lower bound, about 5% of our letters are functionally important. Evolution hangs on to them. They are absolutely doing something. Surprisingly, only about a third of that 5%, about 1.7% or so, directly code for proteins. Proteins are the brick and mortar of our cells. We know that DNA encodes information for making proteins. But out of that functional stuff in our genome, only about a third of it directly codes for protein. We actually have, and we can highlight it, we can identify it, we can catalog it. A greater amount, about two-thirds of that 5%, are functionally important, heavily conserved, retained almost all the way through the mammalian uh, uh, tree, but functions in ways other than directly coding for proteins. Now, we're learning a lot about what those sequences might be. For example, we now know that within that non-coding functional sequences are a whole lot of switches, sort of like dimmer switches on a, on, on a wall. And those dimmer switches determine where, when, and how much a given gene is turned on to make a protein. And so it turns out that a lot of our rich biology are not in our roughly 20,000 genes, but rather a lot of our humanity, our rich human biology, turns out to be in these switches that regulate where genes are turned on, how much they're turned on, how long they're turned on for, and so forth. That's actually where we get a tremendous amount of our complexity. What else have we learned by studying our, the function of our genome? Well, it's not all the primary sequence. It actually turns out that there's a whole other language that we've come to appreciate much greater the past nine and a half years, where we now know that our DNA gets decorated with different chemical groups. It gets modified with groups, it gets associated with proteins, and it gets wound up in various ways. And these marks on our DNA, known as epigenomic marks, are critically important in conveying information and are increasingly being shown to be very important in human health and disease. And it's often the way in which the environment can influence our DNA by putting these marks on the DNA. We're just starting to learn about this. So we're complicated. Uh, we're not complicated in our gene number. We're complicated in other functional parts of our genome and also the way the epigenomics influences this. Well, our institute launched an important project called ENCODE, Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. This is an international effort on a consortium-based way to try to develop a catalog of all the functional sequences in the human genome. This project has been going on almost uh, about seven or eight years, maybe even nine years at this point. Uh, just last month, major publications came out, about 30 of them in total, in both uh, Nature and a major issue of genome research. And a lot of, of interesting effort has gone in, and a lot of interesting findings have come out, of understanding in a catalog fashion all the functional parts of the human genome. In fact, increasingly, any of you can go to the internet, because all this data is available, and find, for example, these two regions of the human genome. And you will find line after line after line of what are called tracks of information both by computational methods and by experimental methods that tell you all about where the genes are and where different proteins bind DNA and where the dimmer switches are in the DNA and which DNA gets made into RNA and which of that RNA gets made into protein. And it's an overwhelming amount of data. And it's, it is simply an interpretation of the human genome sequence and its functional aspects. It's not the final word. In fact, we will be spending the next decade or two or three fully interpreting the human genome sequence. This is just the first foray into understanding the complexity uh, that our genetic code and our genetic blueprint actually contains. And if anything, you should sort of view what we know now, which is a tremendous amount nine and a half years later than what we knew then, is at best a sort of a cliff notes view of the human <laughs> genome sequence. Sure, we sort of know the highlights, but we've got a lot more complexity. And I'm quite convinced that my children and probably my children's children will still be interpreting and reinterpreting the complexity of the three billion letters of our genetic blueprint. So that was the first step. 
What's the second step of accomplishment? Well, the second step of accomplishment is understanding variation across all of us. Now, we're not just interested in how a hypothetical human genome works. We're interested in how our genomes work. In fact, we're very interested in how our patients' genomes work. And these are research activities in these first two domains uh, of, of, that I've described to you. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me remind you, each of you contain two genomes in you. You got one genome from your mom, one genome from your dad. You got six billion letters. And sprinkled across your genome are places where you vary. You have a nucleotide that's, or a base that's different uh, than a lot of other people. I indicated those by V. Well, it turns out, though, that you don't just have a private set of variants. Many of your variants, other people in this room have, and other people in this human population have. But, but most of those variants, in fact, the great majority of those variants, are, have no consequence to anything that you do. They really have no biological consequence. But a subset of your variants actually do have a consequence. Some of them might have a detrimental consequence, such as a predisposition to a disease. Other of those variants might be good variants. They might protect you from a disease or give off some other attribute that would be regarded as positive. So these are risk variants, and some of these are protective variants. But most of the time, they're not private variants. The great majority of them are variants that exist in many, many, many other people. Well, let's see. We have all these variants. We want to understand them. We want to figure out which ones are detrimental. We want to know which ones are protective. And there are a lot. Well, this sounds like we could just figure this out. Again, yeah, it's a finite problem. So this gave rise to a series of international projects. You may have heard of the SNP consortium to find single nucleotide polymorphisms that exist in human populations. That gave rise to something called the HapMap project, which also derived lots of information about human genetic variants across different human populations, putting all that in the database. And the most recent of these international consortiums, the Thousand Genomes Project, another international consortium to industrialize the process of finding common genetic variants across different human populations. Its name is a misnomer. You'd think we were just studying 1,000 genomes. We're studying over 2,500 genomes, all from selected from different populations across the globe. A pilot phase of 1,000 genomes was published uh, in December of 2010. And just two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, I think it was yesterday, actually. If I have my case right, yes, yesterday, came this publication, now available online, which is the latest uh, publication of the 1,000 Genomes effort, where they now have described yet more and more knowledge about genetic variation uh, that exists across different human populations. And again, all this is available um, on the internet. And this is really setting up circumstances, both to understand what an individual's genome typically looks like in terms of how many variants and what it means, and it also sets up studies to better understand how variants relate to human disease. I'll tell you about that in a second, but you might be curious to know something about your genome on average. Your genome by the numbers. So look at the person sitting to your left, or look at the person sitting to your right, and how, how much do you differ by that person? What kind of differences do you have? By the way, every one of you are imperfect, just so you know, get used to what I am too. Okay? But how imperfect are we? And what are our, what are our variants look like? Well, we have six billion nucleotides. Remember I told you you got three billion from mom, three billion from dad. On average, each of us can contain about three to five million places we're are at a given base, we are different compared to the person sitting to your left or the person sitting next to your right. But you know, those three to five million variants that you have, lots of other people have. In fact, most of those lots of other people have. But about 150,000 of your three million or so variants, we haven't found yet except in you, it turns out. So they're not available if you go to the internet and look in databases. So about 150,000 sort of are just yours, or maybe just your family's. And it's actually very interesting. Out of your three to five million variants, we now know there's data that about 60 of them, neither of your parents have. So in the process of making you and making all that DNA and copying it, about 60 places is different than what your parents have. Sort of interesting to think about. Now, and by the way, there's about another 10 to 20,000 places where that, that you're structurally different. And maybe you have a little few nucleotides missing, or a lot of nucleotides missing, or maybe some nucleotides that have blocks that appear multiple times. So that's how you differ compared to the person sitting next to you. Now, interestingly, how, much, how many of those variants are sort of might be breaking genes or might be doing something that makes it so that something's not functional? Well, we know a little bit about that from 1,000 genomes. And we now know that about 100 times, that you know, 100 of those variants actually are disruptive, that actually would break a gene by some criteria. So there's about 100 places where you are quote unquote imperfect. It's actually, we now know that there's about 20 of your genes, both copies of them are completely broken. So out of your 20,000 genes, there's probably about 20 of them that don't even work at all. Neither the copy you got from mom or the copy you got from dad. And you're looking pretty good. So it must be that you can live about 20, 20 out of those 20,000 genes. 
Or maybe some of them do have consequences, and that might affect and explain some aspect of your health and well-being. So that's what an individual typically looks like on average, and it is interesting to ponder what this might mean for human health and disease. But that does set up the third step I want to tell you about of accomplishment, and that relates to understanding the genomic basis of human disease, this sort of this third area. Again, this now starts to set us up into a context of being able to really study these variants and figure out which ones might be relevant to human disease. Now, to describe what has happened in the last nine and a half years in this area, um, I need to tell you, first of all, that virtually every human disease has genetic underpinnings, some to a greater extent, some to a lesser extent. There's almost not a disease you can name that, that genetics doesn't play some role. But the role it plays differs. It depends upon what category the disease falls into. And there's really two broad categories to think about. You'll see how the accomplishments have been different. On the one hand, we have rare genetic diseases. Rare genetic diseases are things like sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease. These are diseases that are rare, but they're genetically simple. And the reason they're genetically simple is that it is typically a mutation or a variant in one gene that is the dominant risk for getting that disease. Yeah, now there might be some other variants elsewhere in the genome that influence the severity of the disease, and maybe there's a little bit of environmental contribution that affects the severity of the disease. But by and large, these are monogenic single gene disorders, um, and they're also called as Mendelian disorders, named after the famous geneticist Gregory Mendel. Now, rare genetic diseases are devastating to families and to patients, but the truth of the matter is, in aggregate, they are not the, the massive healthcare burden worldwide um, as a group. Rather, these are the disorders that fill hospitals and clinics around the world. These are common diseases. These are diseases like Alzheimer's, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, asthma, diabetes, mental illness, some forms of cancer, and so forth. Common diseases are common and are huge healthcare burdens, and worse yet, they're complicated. And the reason they're complex is because it is multiple genetic variants that together conspire with what is typically a greater contribution of the environment that ends up conferring risk for getting that disease. And so the real question and, and the rationale for sequencing the human genome was to provide an infrastructure of knowledge and eventually technologies that would allow us to dissect which variants are responsible for rare genetic diseases and which variants might play a role in comp complex diseases. And the question was, would we be able to develop strategies that allow us to elucidate these genetic variants playing a role in each of these types of diseases? Well, let me tell you what's happened in nine and a half years in each case. In the case of rare genetic diseases, there's been remarkable progress. Shown here is simply a histogram, uh, a cumulative histogram, showing um, genes that were identified that when, when mutated result in single gene disorders, monogenic disorders. Now let me remind you, the Human Genome Project began there, and it is hard to argue with the fact that some of the earliest mapping and sequencing data immediately catalyzed progress in identifying the molecular basis of rare genetic diseases. And it's clearly gone to the present time, and I'll update this at the end of this calendar year, and it will be almost at the, it'll be up here, off the screen. Well, the truth of the matter is that is great progress. At the time the Human Genome Project began, maybe three dozen genes had been identified that went mutated across single gene disorder, and by the end of last year, that was up to 3,500 from three dozen. Clearly, remarkable progress. And in fact, if you sort of plot this in a pie chart fashion, we now know the molecular basis for 3,500 single gene disorders. But that's the glass half full, because the glass half empty is that there's another 2,000 we don't yet know the molecular basis for, and another 2,000 or so beyond that that we think a single gene is involved and we haven't figured it out. So remember this pie chart, because we're going to come back to it when I take you into the future. What's going on with complex genetic diseases? Well, here, um, what I need to tell you is that the idea was to develop a strategy that will allow us to use this increasing knowledge about human genetic variation and figure out whether we could develop statistical associations between specific variants that were known and the inheritance of certain complex genetic diseases like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. And the bottom line is this came to the forefront of a strategy which the scientists in the room are probably familiar with, and I'm not going to spend time to describe in detail, called the Genome-Wide Association Study, which basically used tools that allow us to query people's genomes for known genetic variants to figure out whether there were re regions 
that would have a statistical association with specific variants and getting a disorder like hypertension. And there was a complicated strategy that was used in lots of analysis and statistical uh, manipulations to try to figure out whether or not there was um, truly a correlation between regions of the genome and getting a, and a, and a variant variety therein and getting the disorder. And there were lots of questions about whether this would ever work. And in some extent, some skepticism about whether we'd ever be able to do the detective work effectively to be successful. And the good news was that when some of the earliest data from some of these earliest variation studies came out, the first success story came out and published in 2005. This was for a complex genetic disorder known as age-related macular degeneration. And that got people excited, like, my gosh, maybe we can really use knowledge of this genetic variation and actually figure out regions of the human genome that are containing variants that confer risk for these complicated genetic disorders. And so off uh, it went in 2005 with this as sort of a, uh, as a poster child of success. And we at the, at the NHGRI developed a catalog to start keeping track of these success stories. And so shown here, um, in 2005, you can see this is all the 24 human chromosomes, and maybe it's cutting off over there, but right there is the region of chromosome 1 that was found to contain a variant conferring risk for age-related macular degeneration. And so we started cataloging that publication, and we put a little lollipop on that region from someone and say, there is a variant that's relevant for age-related macular degeneration. 2006, there were a couple more papers and a couple more places we could stick lollipops. But 2007, it seemed that every single time you open a major scientific publication like Nature and Science, Human Molecular Genetics, American Journal of Human Genetics, Boss Genetics, Genome Research, and so forth, you would find another paper successfully showing a correlation between regions of the human genome and inheritance of a complex genetic disorder. And we would increasingly keep track of these papers and we would stick lollipops on the regions of the human genome that had been implicated, and this trend continued. And success story after success story after success story throughout 2009, and we flooded the literature with remarkable progress in understanding regions of the genome that likely contain variants relevant for human genetic disorders. And this can try and continue to 2011. This is the most updated um, graphic. I can tell you we're in 2005, the first publication. As of today, over 1,300 publications just for all the kinds of diseases that you could possibly imagine that are relevant in human health and disease. And we have found multiple, multiple regions of the genome that we want to interrogate. What we have done, by the way, is litter the genome with lollipops. Now, these lollipops, in most cases, just point to regions of the genome that contain variants of which we still have to search through those variants and figure out which is the one that's conferring risk for hypertension or for whatever. But the fact is we've now reduced our search space from the whole three million letters to often just the tens of thousands of bases that we now need to go do more detailed characterization. Now that is the glass half full again. Lots of clues where to now look for genetic variants that are going to play a role in all these important human diseases. We've also learned one other thing that is a little bit sobering but I need to be honest with you and tell you when we have big challenges ahead. We've also learned in the process of characterizing these variants and also these variants that they tend to exist in different parts of the genome. Turns out that for rare genetic disorder, the variants that break genes literally do break genes in coding regions, the parts of the genome that directly code for proteins. It actually turns out the exact opposite seems to be true for these variants, because variants that are conferring risk for these more common disorders are not directly breaking genes for the most part, but rather they're tending to break our dimmer switches. They seem to reside in non-coding parts of the genome, most likely in these regulatory elements we think that are regulating the genes, the dimmer switches. And the reason this is hard is that we don't really understand this language very well. They're really hard to identify, they're hard to characterize, they're hard to prove. This is a more straightforward thing to characterize. This is going to be a lot of work. It's the reason why we need to keep interpreting the human genome sequence and understanding it because it turns out that the part of the human genome that we understand the least seems to be the part of the genome that have the variants that's most important for human genetic diseases, especially with respect to common human genetic diseases. How are we going to advance our knowledge of this? How are we going to go from those lollipops to actually getting to the variants that actually are causing the increased risk for these important diseases? Well, that's going to lead me to my next step along the progression. We're going to need to sequence a lot of people's genomes. We need complete characterization of all the variants that people have in all these intervals, and that means tens of thousands of people with hypertension, tens of thousands of people with diabetes, tens of thousands of people with cardiovascular disease, 
To do that, we need to routinely sequence people's genomes. And here, I will tell you about great progress in the last nine and a half years. Most of that progress has been in these first three domains, but eventually, I think the same progress will be seen in the more clinical domains. Let me take you back to nine and a half years to really set up this incredibly remarkable, in fact, everything I'm going to tell you about today, this has been the most exciting advance in genomics since the end of the Human Genome Project. Let me take you back to nine and a half years ago. I told you earlier that the day the Genome Project ended, we published this strategic vision for what next, starting in 2003. And I co-wrote this paper with other leaders at NHGRI at the time. And we said a lot of things needed to happen now that the Genome Project was over. But one of the things we called for in the paper, and put into print in the scientific literature, was the need for technological leaps that seemed so far off as to be almost fictional, but which, if they could be achieved, would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. Well, that sounds good. But then we got specific. In fact, we went way out on a limb, and we actually gave as an example the ability to sequence DNA at costs that are lower by four to five orders of magnitude than the current cost, allowing a human genome to be sequenced for $1,000 or less. Now, why was that such an audacious thing to put into print? Well, the reason it was a little audacious to put this into print was that this was the day the Human Genome Project ended. On the day the Human Genome Project ended, we had just sequenced the first human genome. And that came at a cost of about a billion dollars. Okay? And we were calling for new technologies that would knock off six zeros to yield the ability to sequence a human genome for $1,000. A little audacious, but it turned out to be the best thing we could have put in that paper. The idea, and in fact, this became a battle cry for the community. It was a $1,000 genome. That became a highly focused goal as much as sequence of the human genome had done. It was, was sort of a highly focused goal of the Human Genome Project. And the idea was to get rid of the factories that had sequenced the human genome as part of the Human Genome Project. And instead develop some fancy new technology, a micro this, a nano that, or whatever, that would end up reducing the cost of sequencing so much so that you could sequence a human genome for $1,000. We started major granting programs in this at NHGRI, but we were met enthusiastically by the private sector who invested heavily into these technologies. Venture capital money came in. And the good news is that I can now tell you nine and a half years later, it's not that we have one new technology or two or three or four or five or six or seven or even eight or nine. We have all sorts of new technologies just shown here are some of the commercially available instruments that are available now. These are known as next generation DNA sequencing instruments or genome sequencing technologies. And remarkably, uh, instruments like this have just completely changed the face of genomics in just the past five or six years. You may be asking with these technologies, how cheap is it to sequence a genome? And I can reliably tell you that today, the cost of sequencing a human genome is something like that. Okay, it's not quite $1,000, but we're creeping towards $1,000. You can actually sequence just the parts of the human genome that directly code for proteins, the protein coding regions, that can be done for less than $1,000 now. Sequencing the human genome costs maybe a few thousand dollars now, but it's not just the sequence in terms of how much it costs, it's also the pace at which we can get that data. And both of those are actually important. So for example, just as a summary, when we sequence that first human genome as part of the Human Genome Project, it took about six to eight years to do that, and it cost about a billion dollars. Now, the day the Genome Project ended, we actually went with calculators and we asked our sequencing centers, all right, if you went to sequence the second human genome, how much would it cost, how long would it take? They sat down and they said, yeah, take about three to four months if you gave us about 10 to 50 million dollars. That was still a, quite an improvement, but still quite expensive. Today, today, with these next generation sequencing instruments, you can sequence a human genome in about two to three days at a cost like, yeah, four, five, six thousand dollars, something like that. By the end, over, probably over the next six months, there's expectations they'll be down to one day. And when do I think we'll get down to a thousand dollar genome? I don't know. A couple of years, few years, it depends exactly how you exactly define what a complete sequence is. It is not what keeps me up at night. I think we will coast to a thousand dollar genome. Actually, people exceed the price. It'll even go lower than that. There are various reasons why I'm optimistic about this. I happen to know about some technologies that are coming out, some of which have been published, some of which have been not. Um, I happen to know what some of our grantees are doing, and I think there will continue to be the surge of technology. It's not going to end tomorrow. There are better and better technologies coming available. Some of these are being published. Uh, for example, we know there are newer technologies. You may hear about nanopores. These are sort of molecules that sit in lipid bilayers, and the DNA gets dragged through, 
and then this, these nanopores they actually read out the DNA nucleotide by nucleotide by measuring uh, various things as the DNA strands go through. One of the reasons I just think this is remarkable in terms of not having to worry about it is that one, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, this is just one company that's going to commercialize an instrument allegedly this year, we'll see if it really makes it by the end of the calendar year, but they openly at a meeting back in February talked about new instruments that are going to come out using this nanopore technology that will allow you to sequence. One was a benchtop instrument, but there was also a second instrument they were allegedly going to sell, which is, is a USB device that goes into your laptop computer that you just squirt blood in and it'll read out a human genome sequence in a day or so. So that's pretty cool, right? But it was like way cool. Way cool is that they're claiming that this USB device will work in both a Macintosh and a <laughs> So to me, I don't worry about this stuff anymore. We even have both platforms covered, and so we're going to get there. So you've learned from me over the last little bit that I'm a glass half empty, glass half full kind of guy. This is absolutely the glass half full. There is a glass half empty component of this, though. And that leads me to my fifth and final step, which I'm not sure is as much a step in progress, but as much a step in reality. The next step along this journey is to be able to routinely analyze all this genome sequence. Well, here's the problem. Simply put, um, and by the way, this affects all the research domains I told you about. <coughs> Simply put, we're the victims of our own success. We have created a new bottleneck. Previously, during the Human Genome Project, even, you know, even the few years after that, the biggest bottleneck was just generating the data. It's no longer the bottleneck. The reality is we're victims of our own success. We've developed these massively improved sequencing technologies, and these platforms spew out data so fast and furious that we simply cannot assimilate it fast enough. We have created a new bottleneck related to the analysis of data. And actually, this is all new for us in biomedical research. We are now existing in this era of big data. And, uh, you know, particle physicists, astronomers, they've had that for a long time, but biomedical researchers, are you kidding? We are still not big data people until now. And it's all changed, and it's created a, a pretty substantial bottleneck. It is the number one thing I hear about when I travel, certainly around the country, actually around the world. What is the major bottleneck affecting genomics now? It is our ability to computationally deal with all the data that we are uh, generating. And there's many components of this. There's, there's just issues around hardware, enough servers to store the data, processors to analyze the data, even enough bandwidth to push the data from site to site. There's issues around software. We're trying to solve this and just having software available to all researchers, not just big genome centers, but all research to be able to take advantage of these new platforms. Oh, and by the way, I know there's some trainees in the audience. Uh, there's graduate students, there's probably some postdocs. I even think there's maybe even junior high, high school kids here, maybe even. Pay attention, workforce. The next generation, learn how to analyze big data. I don't care if you go to medical school, I don't care if you go to graduate school, whatever. Your second skill you absolutely need to know how to do is deal with large amounts of data. That is the wave of the future, whether you're a physician scientist, whether you're just a pure scientist. We're thinking at NIH about how to change training programs to make sure we have minimal competencies in computational biology, biostatistics, quantitative sciences, informational sciences. We've got to train a workforce that can deal with this new reality, and so we will be pursuing that. But the fact of the matter is we'll solve this computational bottleneck, but it's not the only bottleneck. We also have an informational bottleneck. I don't want to lead you to believe that just because I can sequence someone's genome in a day or two or three and use these fancy methods that allow us to go in and take any individual patient and get their genome sequence. Does that mean for an instant um, that with that genome sequence I instantly know exactly what to do with all the information? I mean, yeah, I can get through the bottleneck aspects of it. I can even generate my list of three to five million variants. But the truth of the matter is, you show me any one of those variants, and most of the time, I'll stare at that variant, and I won't necessarily know whether it's biologically relevant or not. That's the state of affairs that we're in right now. Generate the data, yes. Understand the, understand the data, not quite so. And the truth of the matter is, we are sequencing lots of patients' genomes as part of clinical research studies, but the reality is, for the most part, when we round on those patients in the morning, and we come in and we see the list of variants, we're not really sure what most of it means. We are at a very early stage of really appreciating all this information. That's the reason why Harold Varmus, who used to be the head of the NIH, who's now the head of the National Cancer Institute of the United States, when he wrote a commemorative piece about genomics a couple years ago, he wrote that physicians are still a long way from submitting their patients' full genomes for sequencing, not because the price is high, it's really not high, but because the data are difficult uh, to interpret. And that's sort of the state of affairs. A, a practitioner, a, a prominent member of the community, Elaine Martis, recently wrote 
a humorously, you know, thousand dollar genome with a hundred thousand dollar analysis. And yeah, it's sort of funny, but then you sort of think, ah, it's not that funny. And so we got to fix that. So we will fix that, but it represents the reality of what we face in terms of the bottleneck law related to data analysis. So those are the five steps I want to tell you about from the last nine and a half years, if you will. But many of you recognize there's more steps on this journey to genomic medicine, um, and especially as we think about these more clinical domains. We want to think about new diagnostic tests. We want to think about new therapeutics that might come out of this uh, new knowledge. And of course, new preventive measures, and then there's things that none of us have thought about and we'll have to deal with when we encounter them. And so that then leads me to sort of the last thing I want to tell you about, the last part of my talk, which is just taking you to the future, just for a few minutes. Because I think the future is really something that many of us are contemplating, especially thinking about some of these medical applications. And what are some of the things we're thinking about at our institute and what we are planning? Well, to start this description of the, of the future, let me tell you my predictions for the next 20 years. I set you up by telling you about these first 20, the past 20 years. What's the next decade or so going to bring? All hypothetical, my guessing, I think it's going to look something like this. I think we are going to have the next, the highlights of the next 10 years, or at this point, maybe about eight years of this decade, are going to be to really continue to understand how the human genome works, but also in particular to accelerate our pace at which we understand the genomic basis of human disease. With that will come opportunities and more clinical applications, and you'll see some highlights here. But I don't mean to imply for a minute we're going to change the face of medical care before 2020. I just don't think that's realistic. Managing expectations, I think the center of gravity will sit on domains two and three. But I think eventually you'll see a shift rightward. I'm actually quite optimistic of that, but I'm just being realistic of recognizing the complexities that still lie ahead. Well, how are we going to do that? How are we, in particular, for example, going to really take advantage of using genomics to understand the biology of disease? Well, I'll tell you one thing we're going to do over the next eight years, and we're already doing it now. We are going to sequence a lot of people's genomes. Um, we are going to sequence individuals' genomes in large numbers. Uh, it's not going to be the hundreds of people shown on this slide. To be honest with you, it's not even going to be the thousands or even tens of thousands of people shown on this slide. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people's genomes are absolutely going to be sequenced in the next five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Now, this is not going to be happening in clinics uh, or, you know, at, at doctor's offices. It's going to happen at major research institutions, for the most part, associated with large research projects. Increasingly, some of this might be done in the context of clinical research, starting to think about how to apply this clinically. But for the most part, that sequence data is largely going to be generated as part of major research initiatives around the world. The good news is I think the culture of what's happening now is these data, this genome sequence as they're generated, will be put into public databases, made available for research from other world to look at and analyze and help us mine through all the complexities of the human genome sequence as it relates to phenotypes such as human diseases. And so increasingly, this will become a data analysis endeavor as large amounts of human genome sequences are generated. What are the specific areas we're going to emphasize? I'll just tell you what we're doing at NHGRI uh, with that particular emphasis. Using these fancy new sequencing methods, we are now focusing on several things. Number one, we're focusing on this pie chart. We now believe it is time to fill in the rest of this pie chart more aggressively to identify the molecular basis of the remaining known single gene disorders. We've set up a program recently. We've created several centers. who are going to industrialize the process of taking in DNA samples from individuals with rare genetic diseases for which the molecular basis is not known and try to industrialize the process of sequencing those genomes, interpreting that data, and figuring out the genetic defect in those patients. We want to fill in the rest of this pie chart. We've created a program to do that. Meanwhile, some of our biggest sequencing groups that have been heavily involved in genomics, starting with the Genome Project, are going to help us understand these lollipop regions. Uh, to go and take many, many individuals with Alzheimer's disease and with diabetes and with hypertension and so forth, and, and specifically sequence many of their genomes and then interrogate those regions where we know from those lollipop indicated segments likely contain variants and do very sophisticated analysis to figure out which variants in those regions are likely the ones conferring risk. This is going to be very hard. We have a lot of exploratory work to do, but we're industrializing this process as well. If you ask me what some of the lowest hanging fruit of accomplishment in biology disease were going to be, the answer would be resoundingly simple, cancer. And uh, in the United States, at NIH, we have an effort called the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. And this is an endeavor we do jointly with the Cancer Institute we're about 20-something different types of cancer being studied. We're collecting hundreds of specimens of each one. 
and each of those specimens, the genomes are being sequenced, and all that data is being put into available databases so people can look at some of the most common genomic changes that take place in tumors. Cancer is a disease of the genome. The genomes of cancer specimens are deranged, broken, lots of changes. We need to get a better cataloging of what those changes are as a means for better understanding, both for diagnostic approaches and for possible new therapeutic developments. And meanwhile, Cancer genomics is all over the globe, including right here in British Columbia, and many efforts are being coordinated through international efforts of making sure all the major types of cancer are being covered by different groups in different countries, and all that data is being shared in a highly collegial fashion. And I think increasingly you're going to see the changing face of, of cancer because of the infusion of genomic approaches. You ask me, there are other approaches beyond the diseases, some other low-hanging fruit. One of the examples I would give you is pharmacogenomics. We are learning increasingly that the differential response to medication is due to genetic variation that results in how people metabolize medications or different aspects of, of how drugs uh, affect uh, human beings. And increasingly, we are able to understand that, and I think increasingly you will see uh, where uh, prior to prescription of medications, more and more times, you will end up getting a genetic test, or they'll look in your genome sequence to figure out what's the best medicine for you. Getting the right medicine, the right person, in a genomically guided fashion. But then there's some not so easy problems, then there's some big problems, but we're tackling those as well. Uh, we're tackling issues around newborn screening. Almost anywhere in developed countries, an individual's first encounter with genetics comes in about a day or so, when their heel gets stuck, a little bit of blood is taken, and a battery of genetic tests is performed. And that makes total sense. Um, but all of a sudden, when the cost of sequencing drops to a certain level, maybe it would be more worthwhile just to sequence the whole genome and provide insights over what it will then be thousands and thousands of genes that we now can look at to make sure there's not a defect in and, and that are implicated with single gene disorders. And increasingly, we need to understand what that might look like and the ethical issues we can talk about. So we are jointly pursuing this with the Child Health Institute in the United States to have a series of research studies to look at what the future might look like when you can do newborn sequencing as a means for newborn screening. Of course, we're going to be generating lots of information, and that information needs to be disseminated from genomic scientists to healthcare professionals, from healthcare professionals to patients, and each of those require many, many things and barriers uh, associated with public literacy and science and genomics. Healthcare, different healthcare professionals and their ability to manage all this information and access all this information. And we're also doing research studies to pursue that. In fact, I will tell you quite a, another thing I hear about all the time is concerns by healthcare professionals, whether they be physicians, nurses, genetic counselors, pharmacists, physicians assistants, that they need information systems that are well integrated with electronic health records but also allow them to very quickly look up when they encounter a genetic variant in a patient to know what it means. Is this a variant that is going to have any effect on how I treat this patient? And I don't have hours and hours to look it up. I need to quickly look it up on my iPad and, and then move on because I'm running a busy clinical practice. We have no idea what this future looks like, and so we're pursuing new uh, projects to try to start in a pilot phase to try to define this to help healthcare professionals in the future deal with this onslaught of genomic information. So in closing, let me just tell you that I don't want to leave you with this impression that this future is easy. Uh, it's absolutely not. I also don't want to leave you with the impression that everybody in genomics sees this future as happening in the next two years, or the next four years, or the next ten years. There's a significant amount of debate about how quickly any of this is going to happen. In fact, even within my own staff at my institute, or my advisors who I interact with all the time, or members of the community that I also interact with all the time, there's disagreement on how quickly any of this is going to happen. Some people believe that we will casually move our way across these five domains, and eventually we will change medical practice by using genomics. Others, in all of those groups, say, no, 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 we're going to walk pretty quickly. We're going to get there and probably be here by the end of the decade. And then there's the super optimists who say, ah, oh, no, no, we're going to be there in a year. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know which one is right, and I don't know which one is wrong. I actually think the debate is perfectly fine. But I do want to leave you with this idea that there is diversity of opinions on how quickly any of this is going to happen. And I will also tell you that one of the reasons why there's probably not a clear view is that some of this is actually quite new for our community. Because fundamentally, you know, genomics has mostly been a basic science endeavor. I'm certainly a basic scientist, even though I'm a physician. Most of my research career, I was a basic scientist. It sort of gets you first through those first two and a half or so domains. Increasingly, what I've described to you as genomics has moved into disease research, 
is what's known as translational science, sort of moving from sort of basic science knowledge to clinical knowledge. But actually changing the practice of medicine requires yet a whole other discipline that I'll certainly tell you the genomics community doesn't have much expertise. I personally don't have much expertise. That's implementation science of changing sort of a practice within a healthcare delivery system. That's implementing. And that's something that we are absolute students on. And so I think part of the issue here is that we as a community are moving so quickly that we don't even have expertise at these far edges. And I think that leads some people to be a little more pessimistic and others to just feel like, well, we see what's in the genome, we can do anything. And so I don't know which is right, I don't know which is wrong, although overall I'm highly optimistic. And in closing, let me just share with you a quote that I like to use. It was a quote I found of Winston Churchill. In thinking about this progression to the realization of genomic medicine, you know, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. Trust me, genomicists, we are not pessimists. If we were pessimists, we would have never sequenced the human genome and we would not be pursuing genomic medicine. I have the, the luxury of being the leader in the field of genomics, and genomicists are absolutely optimists. Yes, there are huge difficulties to realize genomic medicine that lie in front of us, but I gotta tell you, we see those difficulties and we see them as golden opportunities. So with that, I will stop, and I'm happy to answer any questions and have discussions. Thank you.